Here in Philadelphia, since 1793, they make money. Silver dollars and half dollars, quarters and dimes, and pennies and nickels. And of all the coins minted in this building, the nickel was once the most important to the average American. Yes, for a nickel, any of us could buy most of the little things we needed. Remember when for a five cent piece we could get this, and in most cases a free lunch besides. And for that same nickel, we could buy ourselves a shave, and for two nickels, a haircut. And if we wanted to see Mary Pickford or William S. Hart, all we needed to do was pay our nickel at the box office and all the world opened to the accompaniment of a tinny piano. Well, it's a rare cigar you can buy for five cents now, but what this man still sells for a nickel is worth a million dollars. It is a stamp to send letters abroad. And with it, our ideas and our thoughts and our hopes can span the globe. Here in the post office in New York, these letters are bound for the four corners of the earth, and each one costs, that's right, a nickel. Look at them, millions of them, written by Americans to non-Americans, containing words of hope and sometimes words of sadness, but all part of a great American habit to put it in writing and drop it in the mailbox. Did it ever occur to you that America was settled by mail? Well, it was, literally. When the pilgrims first came to these shores, the Mayflower pouches brought their letters back to the old country, telling about the wilderness and the sun and the rich earth and the rain. And those letters brought more Europeans to join their brothers here. And as the years went by, the letters told of the great men, of Washington and Franklin and Jefferson and Hamilton. And the letters told, too, of the words these men thought and wrote, words that have set the design for free men everywhere. Their letters told that men of principle fought for these words at Concord, at Lexington, and Saratoga. And these letters reached men who were victims of tyranny, men given hope at last. And letters with these five-cent stamps on them told all the world again of Gettysburg, and the story of a people's decision that a nation conceived in liberty should not perish from the earth. And so America fever swept the world. To old Castle Garden and later Ellis Island they came, shiploads of them, to gaze at the Statue of Liberty and the skyline of the new world. And the immigration officers saw that they were from everywhere. So they made their places on this new continent. And then came this proud and great day an ordinary Wednesday, and yet far from an ordinary Wednesday for them, when they became citizens, the Wednesday they joined the people of the United States and became one of them, the Wednesday they joined in vigil with their fellow countrymen to tend and irrigate the tree of liberty, its roots deep in the bedrock of law. And as they trooped down the courthouse steps, all of them without exception had one thing in mind, to write to those left behind, the proud and great news that they were now American citizens. Today, there are 35 million Americans born abroad or whose parents were born abroad, knowing and speaking their native tongues. They write almost a half a billion letters a year, 16 million to countries under Russian domination. What do they write about? What is in all these mail sacks? The truth, the truth about us, about our lives and our hopes. What kind of truth? Well, here in Chicago, home of so many Eastern Europeans, a Pole writes, I came to this country a year ago. No one has checked my papers yet. Not once has a policeman stopped me to ask where I come from or whether I have this or that certificate. This letter reaches Poland and this man's young cousins living in Warsaw in communist terror have found another weapon against tyranny. In Detroit, a Dane was amazed to discover how Soviet lies had penetrated his homeland. He writes, Of course we have strikes in America, but listen to what I say. In Europe, workers strike as a last resort against intolerable conditions. Here they go out for cost of living increases, overtime and pensions. This is not worker oppression, this is worker freedom. And in Copenhagen, this man's father can now refute the Soviet agents and the Soviet lies. A student from Norway who enrolled at the university here in Boston and who has had a thorough indoctrination of Russian propaganda wrote home in a...